Okay, awesome. <clears throat> Um, I also thought it might be fun at the beginning of this lecture to do some kind of introductions. So thank you, Alejandra, for uh, introducing yourself. Uh, from Gridspace's perspective as well, does anyone from Gridspace want to kind of briefly say hi? Hi. Nice. Uh, hello. Cool. Um, Awesome. So I'm going to get started with the lecture and I'm going to share my tab. Um, if at any point you can't see or anyone has a question, I'm not going to be checking the chat. Um, please unmute yourself and just kind of yell out loud because. OK, can everyone see my slides? that visible? Yeah. Oh, uh, yep, I see it. Awesome. So welcome to lecture four. Um, this is virtual. We are not doing this in person since it is Martin Luther King Day. So happy Martin Luther King Day. Don't know if that's something people say. Um, this is lecture four, and we're going to be diving this week into more of the linguistics and NLP side of things. So last week was a lot focused on sound signals, audio signals, how we look at them, how we process them. This one is more on the textual side of the speech signal. So the words that go into the speech, um, actual transcript, and a bit on linguistics, how we break that down for today. Um, so first of all, some course logistics. Uh, project one was due yesterday. Um, thanks for the submissions. Since it is MLK, we're not going to be doing the presentations. But project two was released today. Uh, hasn't been released yet, but will be. And project two is going to be fine tuning GPT-3. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then the upcoming lectures for this week. On Wednesday, we're going to look at syntax semantics word embeddings. So modeling words in vector form. And on uh, Friday, we're actually going to be looking at some of the large language models, specifically Instruct GPT. Um, but Instruct GPT is like the cousin of the chat GPT that everyone's uh, talking about at the minute. Um, finally, all of the lecture videos are being posted on YouTube if people want to watch them offline. Um, and also all the slides are up on the website. So check out iap.gridspace.com if you want to have a look at those. We'll be posting lecture three um, later today or tomorrow. And this lecture will go up at some point. So any questions on that before we get started? Awesome, cool. So this week we are looking at linguistics and more of kind of NLP. So linguistics as an overarching topic can kind of be broken down into these subcategories and all of them are basically how we look at different parts of the speech signal. So from the kind of smallest uh, element of speech, you have phonetics. So sounds, R, E, U, U. Uh, phonology is then the structure of those sounds. So each of those phonemes, um, how you build that up. Morphology, uh, which is what we're looking at today, is kind of the structure of words. So building morphemes up into words um, as a building, as a block of a sentence. And sentences then get us into syntax, which is structure of um, structure of sentences, grammar, how we put that together. Semantics then kind of applies to all of this. So this is then meaning uh, within these phrases and sentences and words. And then pragmatics can kind of be seen as the umbrella of how that changes in context. So um, that's kind of a rough breakdown of the fields of linguistics. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on morphology. Here is your brief interlude of phonetics. Um, these are how we kind of the interna international phonetic alphabet um, from 2020, but this is how we kind of think of sounds, voiced, unvoiced. And there might be a bit of this in later lectures, but we're not going to uh, focus on it today. Today, we're focusing more on morphology. So let's say you take a sentence, the umpires talk to the players. You can split this up into phrase, you can split this up into its words, but within each word, uh, we can actually split this up further into its morphemes. So 
the umpires talked. And then below this, we have the phonetics. So these are kind of the phonemes. You can see the, uh, the um, how you, etc., etc. So words. Uh, does anyone know what this funny thing is? Anyone want to yell it out? Is this that thing from that podcast? Probably. Uh, oh, I forgot what it's called. Uh, I think they talked about it anyway. It's probably in a podcast. Um, this is a wug. This is a singular wug. And if I were to say wugs, you can picture two of these. And you understand that even though wug is a word you've never seen before, I add S and you have two of these things you've never seen before. Um, it's a very famous kind of linguistics um, example and just kind of shows how we build up meaning in words from kind of these individual elements. And we call these elephant elements morphemes. Um, more on that. First of all, I actually asked ChatGPT, what's a word? So a word is a unit of language that carries meaning, can be spoken or written, typically made up of one or more morphemes, which are the smallest units of meaning in a language. Uh, words can be used to convey ideas, express emotions, describe things and actions. They can be combined to form phrases, sentences, paragraphs, which can play more complex meaning. So what does this mean? This means I am redundant and you should just go and ask ChatGPT for a lecture on morphology. But uh, let's say we're not going to do that. Let's have a look at what kind of defines a word. So if I ask you what's a word, the kind of most common way of looking at it in English um, and in, would be kind of by white space, right? This what defines a word as a sentence, you could think of as four words because that's split up by white spaces. Um, brief include, I saw this on Instagram and it inspired the rest of this. So, oh my God, did you hear about parabolas? Or, oh my gosh, tell me everything, I'm all ears. My accent is probably offensive to people, that's okay, sorry. Um, Let's take this sentence and just look at how we divide it up, divide it up as words. So by white space, this would be nine words. Oh my gosh, tell me everything, I'm all ears. But this linguistically uh, or meaning wise, semantic wise means the same thing, but it's six words. Oh my gosh, we have said is three words, but in reality, we can't, take my and replace it with another word. You can't say, oh, your gosh, that just doesn't make sense. So the my in oh my gosh doesn't actually have the same linguistic meaning as the word my when you say like my cat, my food. So whilst this is three words, it's not, the meaning of oh my gosh isn't dependent on the meaning of kind of each of its parts. And we can, put them together to OMG, and this is one word, so we've just taken out the white spaces, but it is exactly the same, means exactly the same. Um, same with all ears. You can't say, I know ears, makes no sense. So it has the same kind of amount as listening. So why, why do we call it two words? Just because it's got a white space in between when kind of semantically speaking, it, it has the function in the sentence of a single word. So we can see that this starts to get more muddled and we then have the word everything, which, you know, by white space is one word, but actually contains these two words, everything, and the meaning of everything actually is the sum of those two parts. You can have nothing, no thing. So in this way, actually everything is one word and oh my gosh is three words, but everything contains the semantic meaning of two words and oh my gosh contains semantic meaning of one word. So white space to divide up words um, doesn't always work. And words is kind of a moving field, right? We have new words being made up all the time. Hangry, yeet. Um, you know what these sounds mean, but I don't know, 20 years ago, that series of sounds wouldn't have meant anything. You have words that change meaning. So catfish used to just mean a type of fish. Um, sick never used to be a good thing. 
words like murder, swagger, and skim milk, interestingly, didn't actually exist in English until Shakespeare. Shakespeare made those words up. Uh, and then you have fossil words that have like fallen out. So the phrase beyond the pale doesn't make sense individually speaking anymore because pale is no longer used to mean like a fence, whereas historically it was kind of stakes or fences. Now it only means kind of a color thing. So beyond the pale, we understand functionally as, a, as an idiom, but the word pale in that sense is a fossil word now. It no longer means that thing. So words are very much a moving, a moving target. Um, we also have unpaired words. So truthful, for example, is a concatenation of truth and full, and they kind of have those distinct meanings, and the meaning of truthful is the kind of same as that same as truthless, but feckless, you never say she is full of feck, he looks pretty kempt, I woke up heveled, or antiquated. The wonders of quated technology doesn't mean the same thing. Um, so in this way, if you were to kind of try and create hard and fast rules in language about how you build up words, sometimes they don't apply. These are actually look like they should be pairings of two words, but it's not pairings of two words, it is a single word. And if you were to try and split it up, you would just end up with things that make no sense. So all of this is kind of the field of morphology. It's the study of words, how they're formed and their relationship to other words in the same language. Uh, and we've already said morphemes, we split words up uh, into the, these building blocks of morphemes. So an example is the word trimmings. We can split this up into these three morphemes. And there are two kind of distinct types of morphemes. You get free and bound. So a free morpheme is something that can stand on its own. So trim is a word by itself, so it's free. Ing, you don't see anywhere unless it's glued to another word. So it is what's known as a bound morpheme. Um, and if I were to go back to these, uh, you can kind of see that in this sense, even though feck kind of is a, looks like it should be a morpheme, it's actually doesn't stand alone. It's not, you don't see it by itself. It is not a free morpheme. Um, we also kind of build up our words with prefix, root, and suffix. So in this sense, um, trim is the root of the word. It kind of encodes the actual meaning, whereas ing and s are kind of more modifiers. So these are suffixes. Um, they modify the word, but the root is trim. And actually, you get two different types of suffixes or prefixes, but you get inflectional and derivational. So an inflectional one is a suffix that changes, it modifies the word in terms of like tense, who's saying it, but the word is still uh, the same type. So teach is a verb. Teaches is still a verb. You've just kind of modified who is teaching, when they are teaching. Um, so this is inflectional. It gives you more information, but it doesn't change the actual word itself. Um, whereas if you were to add ER to teach, you get teacher. This is now a noun. This is no longer a verb. And this is what we call a derivational suffix. So two different kinds of suffixes, inflectional, derivational. And so just kind of to summarize our definition of morphemes, we get free morphemes. These can stand alone. You get found ones, can't stand alone. And within this, Derivational and flexional. Um, cool. Any questions so far on kind of morphemes, how we build up words with them? Awesome. Cool. So now let's go back to our sentence. Oh my God, tell me everything and all ears. And we're not going to define a word anymore by white space. Now, kind of our definition goes as something that can stand on its own that is composed of one or more morphemes. So with this definition in mind, we can start to uh, separate our sentences into words of meaning more. Uh, so this brings us on to longer sequences. So a sentence is a sequence of words. Um, and in kind of what we're dealing with, with audio, 
we actually don't, no one speaks in perfect sentences. I didn't just then, I just broke halfway through a sentence and started a new one. Um, so we have to have a different kind of definition for in natural speech, the N of NLP, natural language processing. Um, a unit of a, a unit of speech might be more of an utterance than a sentence. So if you were to cut off a sentence halfway through, it's still an utterance. So in this way, the uh, eight, eight choose is the utterance in this um, kind of thought. So that brings me on to the next section. We're going to have a look at the morphology of languages um, and how we build up different languages and how different languages treat this kind of building of words. So morphologi morphological typology is the classification of languages by their morphemes and how those morphemes interact. And one unit may, we might use to differentiate morphologically between languages is um, this kind of rate of morphemes, so average morphemes per word. And we can see this in a spectrum. So here is a spectrum, it's a gradient. Um, and on the one end, we have the minimum, which is like one morpheme per word. Uh, if you've ever heard of like an abstract kind of language that has zero morphemes per word, love to hear it, don't think it exists, um, all the way up to a lot of morphemes per word. And we call this kind of an analytic language versus a synthetic language. So on the analytic end of the spectrum, you have really isolating languages. So this is Yoruba, it's a Nigerian language. And this is kind of each word is one morpheme. So one, piece of information per word. Chinese is also a very kind of isolating language, a little bit further up, but in general, you kind of have a character per morpheme. You then get slightly more analytic languages that start to build it up. So this is Afrikaans, um, but Afrikaans comes from kind of Dutch English and English is a pretty analytic kind of language. If you actually think of a sentence in English, you'll kind of, we modify roots with things, but we don't tend to build up large words with lots of little words. Um, fusional languages tend to skew more kind of the Latin languages. So again, in English, we don't, we would be like, we are speak in, those are our morphemes, but we can just say that hablamos. Spanish. Um, and this kind of goes up to a very kind of famous um, agglutinative or kind of aggregative language is Turkish. Um, Turkish actually also tends to invert order of order of things compared to English. But the key thing here is that like, we're building up singular words from all these morphemes. And just by adding these like morphemes together, you can build words that have never been said before, but people will still understand what they mean. Um, so this is kind of quite a fun uh, example of that, how we would say it in English versus just building it up in Turkish. And this is um, an example of agglutinative languages. And taking this even further, you get things like Greenlandic, which is polysynthetic. So a polysynthetic language is you can just keep adding morphemes together. Um, you don't have to split them into words. So why do we uh, why do we care really about whether a language is analytic versus synthetic? The idea is that um, isolating languages are a lot easier for NLP tasks to reason about because you just have to map one token to one meaning, right? Um, versus something like a polysynthetic language where you have to have a lot more uh, information about these morphemes, how they affect each other um, and how you build them up. Also in spoken language and we deal in spoken language, it's entirely reasonable in a polysynthetic language for someone to make up a new word that's never been seen before. And so in order to be able to handle kind of these new built up words, you need to be able to split this down into its meaning and then 
refactor it and then you need a machine to be able to do that kind of refactoring that understanding of the meaning of this kind of built up phrase so it tends to be harder uh, to deal with polysynthetic languages in NLP so an understanding of kind of how your language builds up um, can really help with when you're uh, trying to train a model to understand it. Um, so what are the ways we kind of deal with some of these morphological challenges is uh, if you're just looking to kind of encompass the general meaning of the document, we kind of can do things like stemming. So this is where we actually remove a lot of these modifying uh, prefixes, suffixes, and you just kind of keep the root of the word. So the boy car be differ color, you actually do understand what it means, um, but you do lose a lot of information. A slightly more nuanced way is lemmatization. Um, so this is when you, you do kind of still convert down to the root, but you do keep more information there about the, uh, how the word's being modified. Um, these are just ways of dealing with some of these things since we don't, and one of the goals of this is we don't want to have to encode as a different token or as a different representation, all the different uh, modified versions of, let's say, boys. Boy apostrophe as boys plural, they're not, they're just modified versions of the same thing and we don't want to have to encode them all separately. So that's part of why we, we want to bring words back down to some kind of root understanding plus the modifying information. Um, cool, and as I've already said, polysynthetic languages tend to be harder to reason about. And one of the ways we address this is uh, by, instead of tokenizing large, like complete words, we tend to um, tokenize subwords. And I'll get more into this later, but uh, things like stemming, lemmatization are kind of falling more out of favor in terms in favor of ways of tokenizing uh, subwords now. So morphological challenges, more on that later. This is kind of one of my favorite examples of this. So if I say glove and you've never seen gloves before, um, you're not gonna know what I mean. This is an isolating or more of an analytic kind of language. Uh, whereas something more like German where you build up words, if I would say Handschuhe and you know that hand means hand, you know that shoe means shoes, so hand shoe is hand shoes, you might actually be able to infer what a gloves, what gloves are. So in this way, actually, kids tend to be able to learn um, polysynthetic languages much easier. Um, and you do, there are benefits to, what I'm trying to say is there are benefits to polysynthetic languages in terms of you do maintain more information uh, and you can infer new things, so it makes it easier to reason about, like, out of out of vocabulary, out of dictionary words. It just requires a lot more kind of careful processing. Um, of course, if you're an NLP nerd, you might see GLOVE and you might think, ah, global vectors for word representation. And that's just pragmatics, context. Um, more on that on Wednesday from Sphere, but moving on. Cool. So we've spoken about how you build up words and represent words, but in order to kind of uh, reason about this, give it to an NLP system, we quite often use text. And writing systems also vary hugely in um, the amount of information that's encoded and the way in which it's encoded. So in writing systems, you can break it down into categories of like logographic. Uh, so that's something like Chinese where each character each character kind of is a word by itself. Um, and this is interesting from an NLP perspective because you actually are not encoding any information here or not as much about how the word is pronounced. We're used to English, so like the word logographic, even if you've never seen it before, you understand how it's said, right? Um, alphabetic languages like this tend to be more of a map of how you pronounce the word, whereas Logographic is more of a like, this represents the word. Um, and in this way, like, it's, again, got pros and, pros and cons. Um, you might argue, like, there's no need 
if you know how a word is pronounced, you don't actually need to tell someone how to pronounce it, but it does make it harder for like text-to-speech uh, text kind of seeing with words you've never seen before and that kind of thing. Um, you have languages like Japanese are more syllabary. So uh, each syllable is kind of encoded. Um, Abjad is Arabic, so they actually more kind of do the consonants and then you fill in the blanks of the uh, of the vowel sounds with that. Um, alphabetic languages like the Latin alphabet, it's almost like a phonetic piece for piece uh, map of how you pronounce the word. Um, Abjiga is like more Indian languages and this is each symbol is like a consonant plus a vowel and you kind of get modifiers with that. And then there are also writing systems that build up um, features. So Korean Hangul is a very famous example of this and I'll show you some of that in a bit. Um, yeah, so this is then the kind of consonants of an abjad language. Um, alphabetic, which we're probably most familiar with, the Latin alphabet, Cyrillic alphabets, even like hieroglyphics. Um, this is kind of more Indian languages. You match the consonant with the vowel, and that's kind of what the symbol represents. And then this is like Hangul. So there's actually some really cool kind of featural builds up, build ups of where, like the location of each kind of symbol. And you can kind of go away and look that up. But um, those are some of the kind of categories of written systems. And so we kind of call these, I've been referring to characters. Generally in NLP, if someone says character, they mean like an individual letter but or punctuation. Um, but it really kind of depends. Glyphs is just another way of saying like each individual like written segment. And kind of the technical word for this is a grapheme. A grapheme in the same way a morpheme is a part of a word, a grapheme is a part of a written word. Um, so like a P is the grapheme in the um, in the Latin alphabet. Uh, and how we deal with punctuation is also kind of one of the harder parts of NLP. Uh, do you want to strip punctuation? Do you want to train it on punctuation? A lot of systems tend to like just reduce punctuation down to like a subset of the most common ones, so like a full stop or period, um, comma, that kind of thing, apostrophes. Some things take them out completely, some things keep all of them in. Um, just another design choice, really. Um, so just, yes, a little bit of terminology. Uh, very quickly, actually, I've gone through a lot. Does anyone have any questions? Do a hand check. Cool, okay. Uh, please yell them out if you do have questions. Um, yeah. So a little bit more on kind of NLP terminology and how we deal with, in kind of the computer world, how we deal with uh, words. So I've talked a bit about token, have I talked about tokenization? I'm going to talk about tokenization. Um, but we actually can group words in this thing called n-grams. This is quite a common thing to do in NLP. So a unigram is like your singular token, so I. And I'm going back to this kind of splitting up words by white space, but however you want to define your splitting up of tokens, a unigram is just one token. Bigram is two of them, trigram is three of them. So then when we're tokenizing, we might, if we're tokenizing by trigrams, this kind of set of three would be one like unit. Um, the sentence I am waiting for, for example, actually contains uh, two trigrams. It contains I am waiting and I'm waiting for. Um, also contains biograms in the way of I am, I'm waiting, waiting for. So this is quite a common way of building up context um, in NLP models and just a term to look out for. So why do we care about writing systems? I've kind of mentioned this a little bit, but we want our systems to be robust to misspellings and different spellings. So let's say you're building up kind of an automatic speech recognition system. Um, you're mapping audible phonemes into some kind of written representation. And when we're actually processing um, 
the machine doesn't have kind of alphabets coded into it. We are actually specifying that for it. So sometimes it might be useful to use a writing system that uh, has more of a pronunciation map so that when you're going in the opposite direction, you can deal with out of vocab words and in the other direction, actually phonemes to text. It makes it easier to try and spell out words you've never heard before. Um, so these are just things to think about. Uh, spelling and token kind of ambiguity. So English is also famous for just like, you see the word R-E-A-D, is it read, is it read? Um, there's all kind of those different things. And corpus quality and consistency. So like if you're mixing a bunch of different, and corpus is just like your collection of documents that you're training on. If you're mixing a bunch of different ones, let's say from British English and American English, you might have tomato, tomato. Um, different phonemes, but the same words. So consistency of your corpus, uh, consistency of the written system uh, actually matters a lot when you're trying to do, or, and robustness, so you actually might not want it to be consistent if you want it to be robust to different spellings, different pronunciations. Um, it's just a really important thing to kind of reason about when you're building any of these systems, is how you're mapping those sounds to their words. And we'll see more of this next week with uh, lectures on ASR and TTS, um, Automatic Speech Recognition, Text-to-Speech. But a few more kind of definitions. So we're now getting into how we actually uh, treat these collections of words uh, in NLP. So we have a corpora, uh, corpus, which is our collection of written texts, if we're working with written texts. At Gridspace, we work a lot with uh, audio. So this actually, for us, might be a collection of audio files uh, containing speech. Within our corpus, we are going to have a lexicon. So this is actually kind of your vocabulary, your dictionary. Um, so in the same way a dictionary is a lexicon for the English language, you might have a lexicon specific to your corpus of unique tokens present in that corpus. And this doesn't have to be words. Your lexicon might be subwords. It might be a lexicon of engrams. Um, it's just unique tokens present in that corpus. And how you build that lexicon we'll talk a bit about later. So there's this law called Heap's Law. It basically states that the size of your lexicon, so the size of your um, vocabulary, is a function of the total tokens in the corpus. So it grows according to this kind of power law. Um, the idea being that, yeah, as you get more, uh, your corpus gets bigger, your actual, your lexicon doesn't keep increasing linearly. Um, so for English, K might be 10 to 100, beta is like 0.4 to 0.6. Uh, we also have this law of Zipf's law. So this is that the frequency in tokens in a corpus is power law distributed of one over N. Uh, this is basically saying that if you have the nth most common word in your corpus, it is going to occur one over n as many times as the most common word. Um, and this brings us to this idea that some words are more common than others, but aren't going to be as informationally dense. So the word and, uh, this is kind of stop words in general, but let's take and. It happens all over the place. Uh, we might accidentally weight it more heavily simply because of its uh, commonality in the corpus just compared to a word like uh, frequency, which might occur a lot less commonly, but actually contains a lot more information than the word and in general to what we want to know about a sentence. So there's a really just common um, document normalization called TF-IDF, so term frequency to inverse document frequency. And this is just a numerical statistic that we can use to weight words according to their kind of importance um, in a document. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the depths of how we derive this or what each term really means. You can kind of see it here, but it's basically weighting it so that we don't, uh, so we normalize our document by frequency of words. Um, I just want you to recognize it. If you see TF-IDF, that's kind of what we're talking about. Uh, cool. So this brings me to tokenization. Another quick pause for any questions. Nope. Okay, cool. Don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. Maybe everyone dropped off the call. Nope, y'all are still there. Fantastic. Okay. So 
I like to think of tokenization as essentially like writing system, like glyphs, graphings, but for machines. So all we're doing is we're turning our sentences into a series of tokens that when we're feeding it to a model, the model is going to then be able to uh, reason about, do calculations based off of, um, and understand what we mean. So we talked a lot about kind of definition of words and the function by its kind of function in a sentence, how much meaning we kind of ascribe to the word and the fact that we do want to be able to build off of meanings uh, simply because if you go for an isolating language and you just, or if you just encode every variation of a word, you're going to have an absurdly large um, number of tokens, which isn't good for computation. And you're also not going, you're, it's going to be harder for you to reason about kind of the um, dependencies between those words, like dog and dogs. You don't want to have completely different um, representations. So we do want to do subword um, tokenization. So it might make sense to encode it by morphemes. Um, part of the problem with this is that if you were to just specify every possible morpheme and it's kind of modified versions, you're again going to end up with a huge kind of um, a huge lexicon. And a lot of these subwords are actually going to be unused. So they're subwords that could exist. And so you want to give them the option to be seen, but they might not actually appear in your corpus. And for your particular application, you might not use it. So that's a lot of wasted memory um, on these unused. There's also kind of the other con with subword tokenization is it does require careful pre-processing. As we'll see, this is worth it. Um, and this is what we do in or what most kind of modern um, NLP systems do. Subwords also make it kind of robust more to misspellings and generalizable to more multilingual systems. So if we're saying subword, note I've said subword, not specifically morphemes. Um, we want to be able to only, we want to be able to encode our subwords in a way that is the most computationally efficient for our corpus and also the most informationally rich. And a common algorithm that we use in order to get this kind of subword tokenization is byte pair encoding. So BPE, this is used by GPT-3, uh, all the GPTs actually, I think. Um, which is the basis for like ChatGPT. And it comes from an algorithm that was originally used for compression. It was a compression algorithm. And what it essentially kind of does, you split your sentence into words, you split each word into its characters, and then you iteratively go over this and you merge the most frequent character pairs. And you call that now one unit. And then you do it again. And you keep going until you have a lexicon that is the size that you want it to be. And you're essentially building up your own morphemes based on frequency um, and based on kind of how you can best then encode your center, your, your corpus. Uh, so just kind of going through an example of this. So let's say we have a corpus that's hug and it occurs 10 times, pug, five, pun, 12, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we then split this up into characters, we have these, our vocab is now just each individual letter. And so our corpus now might look something like this. Um, so our first kind of iteration, we go through and we look for the most common pairing. So the most common pairing here actually is U and G. So we might merge these into UG. So now our vocab uh, has UG as its own token, its own like piece of vocab. And we can now change our corpus to look like this. So we're grouping now U and G. And next iteration, we do the same with U and N. Add this as kind of another uh, thing to our corpus. And we can start to encode this. Next iteration, um, you might then get up to hug. And you keep going with this until you get your desired size of your corpus. Um, so if we were to keep going, we would eventually kind of encode hug, pug, pun, and bun, since kind of they are um, 
each have their own meaning. And it kind of looks like this, but hugs, notice we haven't actually, um, if you were to keep iterating, you would put hugs together, but as long as you choose a size of corpus that allows you to get enough subwords that you uh, can encode these different meanings, you can kind of build up your vocab like this. And this allows us to get a lexicon that does have subword tokenization, but doesn't include all of the possible subwords in the like English language or whatever language you're working in. Um, so looking at how this kind of handles out of OOV, out of vocab words, if we were then to give, we have our vocab, our vocab here, and if we were then to give it the word bug, it would be able to split this up into its kind of subwords that it knows from its vocab, V and UG. Um, however, if we give it mug, it's never seen the letter M before. So um, it would actually, that would be like an unknown token and then unknown UG. So this is obviously kind of a design decision about the size of your vocab. You want to make it broad enough to be able to handle these kind of O or B words. But if M is like super, super rare, um, not letter, but if like there's just a super, super rare subword, then it's probably like at scale, computationally inefficient to store it and represent it compared to just kind of calling it an unknown when it happens. So it's a trade-off is what I'm saying, like everything in life. Um, cool, so that's byte pair encoding, BBE. And it means there's less space wasted for unused subwords and you only keep the most useful kind of byte pairs. And the kind of con of this though, is that your tokenization isn't generalizable. It's specific to your corpus and also to the number of iterations. If you were to do fewer iterations, you'd actually end up with a different tokenization. And this can uh, result in issues for like, it affects your word embeddings, your models. We're gonna talk more on that uh, next lecture, but that's just kind of how we would, how we think about encoding words and subword parts for um, a machine to be able to understand. Um, cool. So that's kind of a breeze through of morphology. We looked just kind of to give the roadmap back through. Uh, we looked at the structure of words and how we kind of want to split them up into their function in sentences, um, all the way through to how we actually do this by algorithm um, such that an NLP model can understand it. That's the end of this uh, lecture, I guess. So do we have any questions? Yes. Uh, I have a question, which is, has anybody like seen what happens if you uh, apply byte pair encoding to an analytic language like that's has only one morpheme per word? So something like Chinese. Um, I imagine if you would to, if you're doing it by phonemes, it would make a difference. But I don't know. That would be an interesting thing to look up. But I guess you'd end up with something kind of n-gram-esque on that. I guess I'm wondering, like, could you have your tokenizer just be, like, translate to an analytic language uh, and then have all the words in the analytic language be your tokens? It's not quite... Yeah. I, I assume people don't do that, but it seems like it would kind of work. It would probably... Yeah, I, I imagine that would be um, possible. And you might actually end up, like, Combining, combining words into different, uh, into a new isolated token. But I don't know if anyone's done research on that. I often think of this as more for like polysynthetic, to be fair. Um, any other, I don't know if that answered the question. Any other questions, thoughts, favorite words? All right. I am going to reveal, grand reveal of last, uh, answers from last time. So Uche asked, how do you handle ramp randomness in JAX? The answer is by creating, manually passing around these PRNG keys, and then you use JMP.split, so JMP, remember, was Jack's NumPy, um, 
will be posting this lecture later. And you split, so you progress that random state. So it's a, a PRNG key is like a random number key. Um, and that's how you kind of handle randomness, even though Jax is meant to be kind of immutable and deterministic. So why would Jax not support JIT compiling side effects such as printing in globals, nor dynamically sized argument-based values such as passing a length as an argument to use for a tensor? A Jax autograd is optimized for pure functions, so functions that don't have side effects, so they don't modify anything. Argument-based values are unsupported for JIT code. Uh, for the reason of avoiding this re recompilation. Um, so dynamically sized things cause recompilation and that's like not something you want because it's the whole point of it is to make it faster by not compiling every time, you just compile it once and then run it. Um, so recompilation is something you want to avoid. What are flax and optax and where would we use them in the example application? The example was the um, linear regression and the different kind of polynomial regressions. So Flex is a network module layer for JAX, similar to PyTorch. Optax is then a library of neural net optimizers. Um, it would replace the manual gradient descent, Optax, and the prediction of a linear regression model, Flex, in the example application. So we would, yeah, use Flex in lieu of the linear regression model and we'd use optax in place of the gradient descent. Um, any questions on that? Do people get them right? Do people enjoy kind of clicking through the JAX documentation? Um, cool. And so these are the questions that uh, exercises for next time. So split the word anti-disestablishmentarianism into its morphemes and what does the word end up meaning? Um, see if you can build your own brand new word in Turkish. Um, and finally, run the BPE algorithm on this string um, and see how much you can compress it to. It is originally a compression algorithm. Uh, so what's the smallest number of characters needed to kind of encode this in its compressed form? And uh, just for fun, if you like cutting things out and like, I don't know, using Pritt stick, um, how many words can you use with these morphemes, make with these morphemes? So I will hang around for another couple minutes in case there are any questions. Um, but otherwise, thanks for joining and join us next time for syntax semantics and word embeddings as presented by Sophia Barton. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.